the opening line to the Martin Scorsese film, The Departed, was, I don't want to be a product of my environment. I want my environment to be a product of me. And that completely describes the gangster mentality of the character who said it, Frank Costello. And like gangsters, we've always wanted to prove, over and over again, that we can craft our environment in a way that reflects us. We engage in this to an obsessive level, forgetting about all consequences. Then comes pain, the recognition of how much suffering we inflict on each other, the resulting disillusionments and self-hatred. As evidence became clear that American indulgence in materialism wasn't just an environmental problem, it was an ideological one. The cost of giving your life away to the superficial was no longer just a philosophical question. The counterculture from the 60s fundamentally changed American perception of the establishment. It influenced an entire generation in culture, in music, in politics. The certain disgust for excess, superficiality, the mass unconscious, is some universal desire that anyone can tap into, at least momentarily. But despite its convincing rhetoric, the promise of quote-unquote spiritual transcendence, the promise of supposedly high truths, it kind of just dissipated, fell apart, giving way to problems that seem more important. And now, the environment has changed, and consumption continues. To be clear, anti-consumerism hasn't gotten any less powerful or convincing. It isn't because of what the establishment did, whatever government conspiracy, whatever corporate propaganda was made to keep the masses unconscious that killed off anti-consumerism in its original form. So what happened? Because a lot of this movement and its ideology mirrored that of organized religion, giving its followers a way out of what seems like an unbearable normality. But unlike religion, it never caught on in the same way. So what was missing? What was the hollowness or shallowness that was the reason for its disappointing lifespan? It was so meek that nobody noticed that it almost died off or continued to exist despite its irrelevance. Anti-consumerism is still alive. It never died. Rather, it seems to have split itself up and settled into many corners of the collective thought process so that you can see fragments of it pop up every now and then and you can't tie it definitively into any ideology. In this video, we look at the state of anti-consumerism today and why it's pathetically weak in the face of technology and evolution. The job of the immune system antibody is to neutralize or help kill an apparent foreign substance. Its main job is to recognize a threat or disease and act as a barrier against an attack. So what is it that you see? Say you are the antibody. You see big corporations without regard for anything but their own self-interest. Capitalists who devise and run large elaborate scams. Companies who excessively brand and market their products in the most ridiculous ways a mass obsession with shiny new tech products, a culture that lives off of their good looks, their social status tied to their possessions, instead of what you think is actual talent. You see a population that is addicted to stimulation, to immediate gratification, and you trace it back to the usual suspects, big tech companies like Facebook and Twitter. And why not? They're just the latest in line of monopolies that could give a shit about their customers, doing almost everything to help with profits, no matter the human consequences, no matter the environmental consequences. Companies like Coca-Cola, who literally sell sugar in a can and then invest their hard-earned money into finding creative ways to get you to buy more of their sugar in a can. You see this consumption physical or not, as a problem. This must be the reason why 
there is a divided country, why everyone is in their own ideological bubble, why we can't seem to communicate well, and why we're depressed and socially isolated. You don't know how this became such a big problem. You just know that social media and technology and massive digital consumption has something to do with it. Social justice movements in the 60s and 70s were successful not because of their resilience or continuity, but because it was loud enough to hold attention and point to major systemic problems that led to a new level of cynicism. The resulting major ideological change is validated by what happened in that time period. As language and communication gets more and more precise, it became a lot easier for the population to be aware of all the bad things that the government is doing. From the Vietnam War to the Kennedy assassination, the assumption that America and its government is a force for good, acting with the best interests of the people in mind, was violently destroyed in a series of events. So there was an original belief or ideal that something was pure. Then, somewhere down the line, that ideal model was destroyed. The population left traumatized turned cynical. The resulting counterforce seeks not to resolve or reconcile, but to vacate or distance themselves from the original big lie. Popular anti-consumerism has existed for quite a while. The cult film They Live was released in 1988, and that was just one example of how the reaction against corporate greed had penetrated into American culture. The counterculture in the late 1960s brought with it increased awareness of the side effects of capitalism on the environment. And we can even trace the source of this back to a Christian morality. St. Thomas Aquinas taught that the precise sinfulness of avarice consists on the judgment of someone who considers the acquisition of temporal goods as preferable to eternal goods. But just to give context, as of today, 80% of the world's resources are used by a minority 17% of the population, which means that a relatively small group is consuming far more than they need to. Private consumption per capita is concentrated among the wealthiest countries, and Americans are by far the world's biggest consumers. This is despite anti-consumerism naturally allying itself to the counterculture that took place in the United States over half a century ago. So is all of this just a drop in the ocean? Is greed just too strong? Are the capitalists just too powerful and convincing? It's not just in rich countries, by the way. Some of these statistics don't really do a good job. In middle-income and poorer countries, consumerism is also doing very well. Communist China is a huge market for capitalists from around the world. Consumerism as a whole is here to stay. Currently, we deal with a whole new level of consumption, digital consumption, and consumption of information. There should be a destruction of the idea that consumption is only physical, and that side effects, the pollution of the mind, the toxification of channels of information, is even more powerful because it's the commercialization of a volatile substance called belief. In the mainstream, there is already a significant recognition of excessive digital consumption, but this is the typical response. our use of tech, our relationship with our devices, the way that we use social media. A picture of a world where we're all under continual surveillance with the somewhat insidious intention of marketing to us. have selected and ordered in a specific way to, and this is something they do very deliberately, to manipulate your emotions and to manipulate your cognition to get you to spend more time in the platforms. And they are presented in a way with likes and retweets. I see that as being the, 
the function of the the internet is this sort of like or we had coherence there was a sort of set of gatekeepers there's a coherence to the narrative there were all these ideas that were allowed and were not allowed and suddenly with the internet we've got the d- democratization of information mm. and so all of these kind of little little white lies or gray areas will fuel it's almost like an ecosystem you're just creating the 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 ecosystem or the 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 growing conditions for more and more esoteric conspiracy narratives and it's because of what social media has done to universities and so many other institutions in the last uh, seven years or so. Um, in fact, I have come to believe uh, that a free and open society cannot continue much longer if social media continues to damage three things that I really care about. And those are young people, universities, and liberal democracy. Unfortunately, the stewards of this political organizing are not the people themselves, but tech companies. You see, tech companies like Facebook and Twitter allow an enormous amount of misinformation and dangerous misuse of their platforms. They are not financially incentivized to stop doing this. They are not financially incentivized to ban people, to moderate misinformation, or to be responsible for their own platforms. In other words, excess consumption whether it's consumption of media or material goods, seem to me so impenetrable that it's a feature, not a bug. It is just that with the internet, consumption is now taken to a different level. And the best argument that we can come up with against this new consumption is that, well, our brains are not supposed to be this stimulated. We're not supposed to consume this much content. Now we're much better at pointing out what is wrong. But even then, it's still so abstract and rational that even the people saying these things don't seem to believe that they can offer a way out. So we're compelled to think of this as a problem to be solved, a great inconvenience to be overcome, another threat that we have to pivot away from. The extent of their understanding seems to be that there is a hyper-focus on the present because tech companies make money by holding your attention for as long as possible, resulting in addiction to stimulation and a shorter attention span. They only look at it as an exploitative mechanism with bad side effects. That we're not used to being exposed to this many people and this much gratification, and so we should return to a less stimulated existence. Much like the counterculture, this reaction is one-dimensional, underdeveloped, and therefore doomed to fail. A drop in the ocean against a massive wave of change and evolution. When society changes and evolves, commercialization doesn't phase itself out. It moves along with it. The worst thing about this is, it's not even clear that these people actually understand what they're saying. For them, It's just another talking point that they can throw out there to make it seem like they're telling you something that the quote-unquote masses don't know. Because in the end, who doesn't need to sell themselves? Who doesn't need to find ways to get your attention? If you want to know why rationality, reasonable consumption, or even equality within a society seems to exist only in small pockets, as a luxury or an exception, and never as a norm, You have to look at hierarchies, not just in power or influence, but in raw numbers. One way to look at it is that even though the counterculture got a massive amount of attention and its ideas quickly adopted into mainstream culture, that doesn't mean that it is actually practiced by the majority of the population. Most normal people are normal, doing normal things like working a job and building a family in the same way that the majority are not radically left or right politically, and that most would rather avoid political discussion, as it would ruin their normal human relationships. Most time in human lives are not spent participating in political activity or acting on an ideology. If there is political activism for a religious agenda, special interest, or anti-establishment movements, it has to be done as an exception to the rule. 
they have to be in a position to break from normal behavior patterns. When you're caught up in some trend or fad, it seems that in that moment, missing out on it means you'll lose everything. Same thing with ideology, the collective unconscious, as well as the reaction to an established order. They must rely on their ability to hold your attention by seeming more real than they actually are. If we look at it this way, it starts to make sense why a minority of the population can hold the most attention, the most power, and the most wealth. The second way to look at it is to follow the trail left by the leaders. In every time period, there is a class of thought leaders who are smart enough, enough is the key word here, to convince a majority faction that they possess the truth, or at least know their way towards it. And so the state of these people determines the state, or the health, of the collective thought process. Take a look at how some of these people answer questions. Both Tyson and Hawking are people with great credibility in our time. When they say something, it can be debated, it can be controversial, but the important thing is that people listen. Deeply religious people are certain he exists, he or it. There are ardent atheists who are sure God does not exist. My posture is, particularly in the monotheistic traditions, that God is typically described as being all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. Yet I look back through history, uh, in particular there is a, I, mean, I can choose many examples, but one, a famous example is the earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal. When was it? 1755, somewhere around there. 80,000 people died. By the way, that earthquake took place on All Saints Day, in the morning, when most people, Lisbon, one of the holiest cities in Europe, most people were in church. Do you think Trump as president in his four years also betrayed the working class? Um, not in the same manner, no. Really? And I think Trump did some things that were really quite spectacular. Uh, like one what? of them. Like what? Well, how about no war? Well, he did assassinate a top Iranian commander no, 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 who was no. fighting I ISIS I didn't on the say, ground. Say that about, I didn't say anything about assassination. I said something very specific. Yeah. You, I would say Trump that's an act of not, war. No, it's not an act of war. It's an assassination. To, an act to of kill war an Iranian involves, commander? I don't understand the point you're making. Do you consider the, the giant increase in drone strikes under Trump problematic? What do you mean problematic? You mean desirable? Do, do you Because you said, oh, he didn't get us in a new war, but I would consider all those bombings, which are illegal, by the way, an act of war. Do you think I didn't that those say are... That Trump, I didn't say that Trump record was unblemished mm. or that there weren't skirmishes of various sorts. Note how they have to pivot to avoid having to directly answer the question. And Jordan Peterson can't seem to give a simple answer to any question unless it's something that he has strong emotions about. And who can blame them? They basically have no choice but to cloud difficult questions with complexity or divert it into something unrelated because they're just not able to answer these questions at all. And again, you have to deal with the fog of war. And there are things that you don't know that you will have to find out in order to win. By making a guess on what exists beyond your field of vision, based on what you've seen before, certain patterns that you assume will repeat themselves the more you don't know, the more assumptions you have to make, the more you rely on belief. One way or another, the vacuum of the unknown has to be filled by either a high quality or poor quality filler. Through the time periods, societies shift their attention or deference 
to intellectual authority figures based on what happens to be the most convincing for the moment. But it just so happens that the current intellectual authority figures, our current thought leaders, have developed an obsession with not knowing, or agnosticism. But so what? It's great that they're so self-honest, right? If you don't know something, just say that you don't know. But that agnosticism is like a credit card. And your lenders are all the people on the other side, trusting that their faith will be rewarded. You've effectively delayed payment for a future date. There's no way you can not know, forever, without consequences. So on the one hand, they can not know whenever they want. And on the other hand, they expect to be listened to because they're an authority figure. Again, this says nothing about the accuracy of what they say, but you can see how you have voluntarily given up control over thought to them because you understandably assume that they can do a better job at it than you can. Their job is to know, to know on behalf of you, but the problem is that they don't want to. In the environments of excessive intellectual discussion, they have to somehow capture what is true and objective in an absolute sense. But since they're deathly afraid of being wrong or contradictory, they have to come up with statements that are so neutral that they completely avoid being wrong, essentially absolving themselves from taking a position on anything that actually matters, no matter how obvious the right answer is. If you are in a position to be agnostic, that's actually a very good thing. That means the freedom, for the most part, to craft your own narrative. It's the freedom to be rational, free from religious ideology. But in that process, the intellectuals have completely abandoned the subjective, retreating into the objective, where they can safely make predictions that can be easily be cross-referenced. The subjective needs a system of belief to latch onto, and so one way or another, that void will be filled. And the vacuum left behind can now be filled by the worst of the worst, the type you see now. Their only interest is not what is true or accurate, but to get attention without giving anything in return. And people wonder why rampant consumerism takes over, simply filling the vacuum left behind by the breaking down of any believable structure that describes the ultimate, what Jordan Peterson himself would say, a crisis in meaning. So the people who are supposed to know refuse to know. And the people who do sense this problem would rather use it as an opportunity to combine it into an argument about the things they don't personally like. The end result is confusion. Chaos, which is then, of course, filled by an unapologetically superficial ideology. Because one way or another, a belief in something is needed to fill the void. And here is where the consumer and the anti-consumer intersect. Momentary alignments that make them different sides of the same coin. The unconscious, vanity, desire, doesn't exist in isolation sitting in one place, waiting for you to get rid of it. It can find a home literally anywhere and manifest in any form needed to buy the time and space needed to exist. Selling yourself, convincing people that you are worth something is a universal problem. Consumerism is only the most unapologetic version of it. commercialization, and therefore consumption, can twist itself into any form that is necessary in order to sell. It takes no effort to go on a platform and say that they are scamming you, they are lying to you, you are being exploited. This is the truth. 
It's an easy way to get attention, promising to reveal something important that the masses don't know. Anyone can play the role of being the exposer of all the evils of society. Now, of course, in the case of anti-consumerism, this would be a correct narrative. Consumerism is a plague, so accuracy isn't the problem here. But notice that this is an easy narrative to settle on. Everything falls into place almost perfectly. The evil corrupt corporations are exploiting you for profit and destroying our world in the process. They're taking control of your mind. They dictate what you believe, and so on and so on. For a short while, you slip into the role of someone who is above the unconscious masses. See, this wouldn't be a problem at all if you took anti-consumerism just for what it is, a reaction. But if you pay attention to ideology, you'll know that this almost never happens. When given the chance to crusade against the forces of evil, it doesn't matter the time period, it doesn't matter if it's in the name of God, or science, or truth, or justice. People want to run away with that little sliver of truth that they possess and take it to the very end. So now you'll have to come up with the ideal solution for how to regulate the success of consumption, how to create the ideal society post-consumerism. You know that you can't just react to something. You have to convince people that there is a correct alternative. Meanwhile, the world has a way of ticking on, steamrolling every intellectual argument, every activist movement, and every scientific study. Mass consumption, at least on a global level, is here to stay. And that's the fate of the shallow anti-consumerist. Constant disappointment. As rationality permeates closer and closer within the collective unconscious, the superposition is made to better replicate the sum of all human needs, and of course, all human perceptions which means that it also incorporates all the evil and corruption learned from all the previous mutations of societies. Let's assume for a moment that marketing is bad because you're trying to prop up your product as opposed to others. So you don't do it. You have an idea for a product that isn't perfect, but your competitor's product is downright poisonous. It's clear that your product idea is better. But you need to market your alternative. Your problem is this. You don't like the old product. It makes you sick. But you yourself need to sell the alternative. It turns out you also need to package a product to sell. You need to promise them that the solution isn't this, but that. Otherwise, who's going to bother listening to you? You start to see the existential problem here. Do you see how this problem translates itself perfectly into the next set of constraints? Is it starting to make sense why the same problems keep reappearing no matter how radically you try to change the environment? The thing is, they're completely right. Excessive consumption is the biggest problem of this time period. In an environment that is too safe, too tolerant, and too prosperous for its own good, the collective will eventually find ways to avoid hitting a brick wall. They have to find new constraints to break, new ways to shape and manipulate the environment for themselves, new games to distract from an otherwise meaningless existence. It turns out that this game has externalities. The outward prosperity, abundance, and convenience is only possible if another group foots the bill. You bought into this fairy tale, a promise that you know is too good to be true. But when the story predictably takes a turn for the worse, you still react badly. 
Your relationship with technology is like a rich person's relationship with privilege. Imagine you're a rich kid with everything handed to you, allowing you to pursue pleasure and personal success. And then, of course, you reach the limit. It comes to an end, and the rug is pulled from underneath. You become depressed. It turns out that being so enabled has bad side effects. But you already bought into this idea of pursuing highs, and you've made your whole identity around that. It tricked you into believing it was something greater than it actually was, and now you're angry at it. So you go and you tell everyone you know, all your friends, and the entire world, that this thing is bad, and your whole life was a lie. That's a basic version of our relationship with consumption. And so what you get out of this, instead of less self-centeredness, is more self-importance stacked on top of self-importance. It really is a special type of arrogance, available only to the select few. But this is all we seem to have in the fight against rampant consumerism. We tend to think of intellect and intellectual arguments as deep. But you don't really pay attention to how it is incredibly shallow. To deconstruct an object and analyze it is necessary. But you have to remember to factor back in all the things that you have factored out. Talking about consumerism in this vague conceptual way is exactly what cheapens the analysis and turns it into just another consumer product. Because yes, this is a very consumerist society. So much so, that even the anti-consumerists seem to have no other choice but to argue against it on its own terms. <laughs>